Hello folks, my name is Josh Taylor and I'd like to welcome you to the 12th annual Telling Tales Festival and our first ever virtual gathering. Whether you are a veteran fan who has been to the festival or whether this is your very first time joining us, we are so happy to see how stories connect us, no matter how far apart we live. Speaking of where we live, the Telling Tales Festival happens in a place where people have lived and told stories for thousands of years. It is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat, and the Neutral Peoples. Today, it is home to the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and to many other indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We recognize our responsibility to learn about their rich history so that we can better understand our roles as caretakers, neighbors, and friends. With a good heart and mind, we honor the sacred indigenous tradition of storytelling by presenting our program today. Miigwech, Nyawe, and thank you. Today's episode is called Earth and Sky. Today we are going to hear about what we see when we look up and what we see when we look down. We will walk outdoors, learn a new craft, a new song, and have some fun reading a story together. Watch this whole episode for a chance to win a book from one of today's authors. I'll be giving you clues about what to do to win, but you've got to listen closely. Let's start today as Andrea Curtis takes us on a walk through the urban forest. Andrea Curtis loves trees and wants to encourage everyone to take care of them. Her book, Forest in the City, is full of ideas of what we can do to help the trees in our own neighborhoods and beyond. Hi there, I'm Andrea Curtis, and I'm gonna to talk to you about trees in the city. Come with me. I love trees, and I love living in the city. But for a long time, I didn't think a lot about the two of them together. I guess I thought trees were mostly a country thing, as if I had to find a forest far from buildings and busy streets in order to see trees. But trees are everywhere in our cities. We call it the urban forest. We have trees in parks like this one. We have them on lawns, around buildings, and on sidewalks. And the more I've learned about city trees, the more I see them. The more I see them, the more I appreciate them. Trees do so much for us. Imagine a city draped in a blanket of green, a place where trees lean over sidewalks, lending shade to people and other creatures, where the air is cool and clean, where the trundle of streetcars and the sound of honking horns are muffled by the trees and branches. Imagine a busy, humming city with a lush canopy of leaves, making everyone down below feel safe, calm, and connected to the earth. Is this the city you know? Did you know that trees actually help us breathe? They also make our air cleaner, fight pollution, and help with climate change. Have you ever been out in a city on a hot day and found a nice place to rest under the big branches of an old tree? It's actually a lot cooler there. When we plant trees near buildings, they shade the buildings and people don't have to use expensive air conditioning as much. Researchers have actually done scientific studies and discovered that simply seeing trees outside your window makes people feel happier and recover faster when they're ill. A street lined with trees can also slow down cars that go too fast on our streets. You probably also know that trees are home to lots of birds and animals. I bet you've watched squirrels chasing each other around a tree trunk or a raccoon balancing on a branch. And just like those creatures, we can even eat the berries, nuts, and fruits from some city trees. But ask your parent or caregiver first. Trees do so much for us. The least we can do is say thank you. So I've been writing letters to some of my favorite city trees. You might want to do the same. 
send them into the Creativity Club at Telling Tales, and we'll post them on the website. Here's one I wrote to the tree I planted when my first son was born. Dear Lilac, thank you for your shade and your sweet perfume that fills the summer night. I look forward to seeing your deep purple blossoms each year, though they last for such a short time. And here's one my friend in grade six wrote. Dear Apple Tree, you've been with me my whole life and I love climbing you. You're always reminding me that there's beauty in the darkest places. I love you. Trees are living beings. They're part of our cities and they're part of our lives. We need to protect them and make sure they can thrive in our cities. So why don't you write a note to a tree? What would you say to the tree you pass every day on the way to school? Would you thank it? Ask why its roots are pushing up the sidewalk and making you trip on the concrete? What would you say to the baby tree that was just planted in the sidewalk near the coffee shop at the top of the street? Would you whisper your hope that it will survive even though it doesn't have much soil or space? I've also been making some crafts using paint and paper and things I found around the house so I can write letters to my favorite trees. Check out my YouTube video at the link here for a how-to and send in your note to a tree. There are so many ways trees make our lives happier and healthier. Even though the trees can't speak, we can. Together, we can make sure everyone knows how important trees are to us, to our cities, our communities, and to the planet. Thanks for joining me. And don't forget to speak for the trees. I've started my letter to all the maple trees that give shade along the sidewalk of my street. And now are starting to turn bright red and orange. Why don't you write one too and upload it to the Creativity Club on the Telling Tales website. We'll make sure your tree gets it. Mr. Ben is here with a song about what happens when we slow down and look around. That also rhymed. Hi, I'm Mr. Ben, and I'm going to sing you a song about seeing things in the world around you. You ready? Look up, look down. Look at the world around you, look high, look low, seeing things in the world you know. Look up, look down, look at the world around you, look high, look low, seeing things in the world you know. Oh, you can see birds, can you name them all? Look up in the trees, some are short and some are tall. You can see bugs. Pillars and ants. There's so much life out there among the flowers and plants. But I bet I don't need a dog. But I bet I don't need a dog. But I bet I don't need a dog. Look up, look down, look at the world around you. Look high, look low. See new things in the world you know. Look up, look down. There's one. Can you name them all? Look up high in the trees. Some are short and some are tall. Oh, you can see bugs, caterpillars, and ants. There's so much life out there among the flowers and plants. But I bet I don't need a dog. But I bet I don't need a dog. But I bet I don't need a dog. Have a look, see what new things you can see today. Thanks, Mr. Ben. Your song inspired me to just lie on the ground so I can look up. It's a great way to see the moon. Speaking of the moon, our next book is called Moon Wishes. 
by Patricia Storms. Patricia Storms published her first cartoon in a Toronto newspaper when she was 12 and has been writing and drawing ever since. In Moo Wishes, she imagines what it would be like to be the moon, shining down on everyone and guiding them safely home. Hi, I'm Patricia Storms, and I'm here to read, draw, and talk about the moon. A few years ago, my husband and I wrote Moon Wishes, and we were inspired by the moon, which we saw at night in my backyard. So, Moon Wishes. If I were the moon, I would paint ripples of light on wet canvas and shimmer over dreams of snow. I would wax and wane over the earth's troubles, wishing peaceful sleep for worried hearts. If I were the moon, I would give a voice to those who need it and, oh, and welcome the dark and joyful howls of a winter night. I would be a beacon for the lost and lonely, lighting the way home. I wish I were the moon, for the moon is a god to wing creatures. If I were the moon, I would light a path for traveling friends. And if I were the moon, I would make myself big and bright, strong with love. So that I could shine. There's a girl playing the ukulele. And I might play the ukulele too. And sing a moon song just for you. And now, some moon music to go with those moon wishes. That was my favorite part. So, do you have a special collection of any kind? I like to collect comic books, records, and things about hip hop. Let's go visit Royal Botanical Gardens to discover a really big and unusual collection of art and to see how it's made. Located at the western tip of Lake Ontario, Royal Botanical Gardens has 1,100 hectares of nature reserve and several formal gardens, including Henry Garden, the home of the first ever Telling Tales Nature Tales Festival held in 2019. Hi everyone and welcome to Henry Gardens at the Royal Botanical Gardens. I love Hendry Gardens because it has 16 special little gardens all rolled into one and over the last seven years it's become home to a growing collection of sculptures known as the Dan Laurie International Sculpture Collection. Each of the sculptures in the collection is completely different and comes from a different place in the world. And one of the newest and most fun and playful pieces is by an artist named Peter Colleen and he's from Ireland and his sculptures are a set of five sneaky rabbits. Throughout Veggie Village, there are five bronze rabbits hiding. There's Alert, Sleepy, Launch, Serious, and Bashful. And all the rabbits are made of a super cool metal called bronze, but they start out as a wax model just like these. At his studio in Ireland, Peter starts with models like these made of wax. He made these to play with the shape and size and pose of each of the rabbits. Then he made bigger ones out of clay where he got the look just right. From there, Peter sent the clay sculptures to a foundry. A foundry is a really cool shop that takes Peter's sculptures through a few steps to turn it into bronze. First, you have the wax mold. Then it gets dipped in slurry and sand. Then it gets baked at a super hot oven that's a thousand degrees. After it's baked, the mold gets filled with hot, molten bronze. Once it's all cooled down, the bronze sculptures get broken out of their shell and Peter goes back to work sanding, polishing, and adding color and texture to finish the sculpture. Perfect! 
He boxes them up in wooden crates and they take a long journey on a cargo ship to Canada. Now they're hidden throughout Veggie Village for you and your friends to find the next time you visit the Royal Botanical Gardens. And if you want to learn more about the collection and how they're made and see some really cool videos, you can go to the RBG's website at rbg.ca backslash things to do. See you later. Isn't it crazy those rabbits started off as little wax models? Do you think you can make something like that? Maybe with plasticine. Speaking of plasticine, our friend Suzanne does amazing illustrations with it. I forgot who was talking. Suzanne Del Rizzo has always loved getting her hands messy. She creates beautiful textured pictures with plasticine and clay that help bring stories to life. And before you were born, Suzanne's illustrations celebrate the wonder of nature and family. Hello everyone, my name is Suzanne. I'm excited to share my book with you today, which is not only a love letter to an unborn child, but it's also a celebration of our earth and sky and some of the incredible animal families of our natural world. Before you were born. Before you were a song in our hearts, a star in our eyes. A smile on our lips, shimmering skies. The sun on our faces, the full moon at night. The tiniest murmur of tender delight. You were a curve in the road, up ahead, out of view, a whispered secret that only we knew. Sunrise ribbons ripple and flow, silver birches tremble below. And now, slumbering sweet, awakening soon, first bud of springtime, ready to bloom. Sleep on our sighs, adrift on our dreams. Soft as mist, floating low over streams. Your name in the clouds, your voice on the breeze. Your kiss on a raindrop, your face in new leaves. A mountain of promise, a valley of calm. Light of the world curled into our palm. Where Father Sky meets Mother Earth. A new family dawns in the glow of your birth. And can you tell from looking at the illustrations in my book what medium? They are. They are polymer clay. Sometimes I work in plasticine as well, but this book is made of all in polymer clay. And here's an example of polymer clay here and plasticine here. And you can find them pretty much at any craft store. Even some dollar stores will carry them. And what kind of tools do I use when I'm making my artwork? I use all kinds of tools, like the ones you can see here. And a lot of them are ones you can find around your house. So I have like an old used toothbrush. Once you use it, you don't want to use it again in your mouth. <laughs> a pin and a toothpick and even a pencil are tools that I use quite often. And those you can find around your house. For backgrounds or for my backing, I use a little thin piece of illustration board, but cardboard from the recycling bin or paper plates works just as well. Here's a couple examples. So when I get a manuscript from a story, this one was written by Deborah Kerbel, um, I read the story over a few times, I think about it, and then I start hopping on the internet and coming up with a theme. And the theme that we discussed for this book was not only about an unborn child being born and a love story to it, but also incorporating all, all sorts of animal families and their natural habitat and how they raise their young, because animals are very interesting. So I've got lots and lots and lots of reference images that I pour over and it helps me make sure that I get all my animals looking right and also the habitat correct. So once I go from there, I start sketching. And you can see from here we've got all sorts of little thumbnail sketches and they're really fast and loose just to get my ideas down. 
And from there, when everyone's happy with them, I scale up the illustrations to full size. And then they're much more detailed and refined. Sometimes I use a little bit of tracing paper, like this bird here, and I can reposition it around and you can find just the right space. And when those are approved, then the fun really starts because then I get to start with the final art. And to make the final art, I start and I work from the background forward. So I'll get my piece of illustration board. We're going to work on the deer one. And if you recall, on the deer, they're kind of lying under the leaves. So we would start with the dirt. And I would just take a little bit of brown, make a snake, peel off a little bit, and go all the way along the illustration board until you've covered the entire thing like that. And then the next layer up would be my little deer. And so I work on top of a little Ziploc bag and I've worked here on the, the belly and the body of the deer. You can just gently peel it off and stick it on. And then working on the head of the deer, I'm just finishing up the ear. So I get a little bit of gray, add it on, use some of my tools. And I can use my toothpick and add some fur texture. Adding the texture is one of my favorite parts. It really brings the illustration to life. And you can just stick it on and then I gently peel it off my Ziploc baggie and I add it on. I'm just pushing it on gently so you don't squish it. The great thing about polymer clay is that if you're not really happy with how it turned out, if you're just not sure, you can always peel it off and try again. The next layer up would be our leaves. And so for my leaves, same thing, I've got a whole bunch of different colors of green that I've flattened out on a pasta machine, a little pasta press. And you can see some here. And you simply peel them out. I've used my toothpick or my pen to make all my little patterns, all my little leaf veins, and then I just stick it on. All different colors. Some of them I baked separately. When it's all set to go, you just bake it in the oven and then it gets photographed for print. Here again is the final illustration. And you can see it's quite dimensional. Some of the pieces I glued on afterwards just to really give it depth to show that those little deer are underneath all those leaves hiding. So that's a little peek at the process behind the artwork. I want to thank everyone, Telling Tales, and everyone for joining me today. I hope I inspired you to make your own artwork, and I hope that you can create some earth and sky themes that incorporate um, our incredible animals of the natural world. Isn't that a cool way to make a drawing? Do you think you could do that with plasticine? It would be fun to try, right? Here's another cool idea of something we can try from the Art Gallery of Burlington. The Art Gallery of Burlington is Burlington's public art gallery and community art center, where creators, cultures, and communities meet and share in the wealth of human creativity. Hi everyone, my name is Heather and I'm an art educator at the Art Gallery of Burlington. Today I'm going to be showing you how to do nature rubbings from things that you can find outdoors. So let's get started. For this project, you will need a plain white and a plain black piece of paper, a white and black crayon with the paper coverings removed, and some tape. Next, you'll need to find some objects in nature to make your rubbings with. Flat objects such as leaves work best. Look for fresh leaves of different shapes and sizes to use for your nature rubbing. The best time to look for leaves is after a windy day. You can find lots that have fallen naturally from the tree to the ground. Have a grown up with you and enjoy a nature walk together. First, take your leaves and turn them upside down so the bumpy side of the leaf faces up. This will help the imagery to show up better through the paper. Arrange the leaves on a flat surface using different shapes and sizes helps to make your design more interesting. Once you are happy with the layout of your leaves, take a white piece of paper and place it over the leaves. Using a small piece of tape at the corners to help keep the paper from moving and shifting as you do the rubbings. Next, hold the black crayon on its side and gently but firmly rub the side edge of the crayon over the paper. By rubbing the crayon over the paper, the texture and outlines of the leaves start to appear on the paper. This process is called frottage. Keep rubbing the crayon on the paper until you have captured all the leaves underneath. Try this process again with the black paper using white crayon. 
Using the white crayon over black paper makes the leaves look almost like an x-ray. See how they look side by side? Are they the same or different? Try it again using different color crayons. Which version do you like best? For more creative activities, visit our website to learn about our AGB Family Open Studios. They happen every weekend and are made possible through generous support from Rotary Club of Burlington Lakeshore and Burlington Hydro. Thanks for watching! Pretty great, eh? It's a fun and interesting way to use the natural things we can find outdoors to make original art. Why don't you upload a picture of what you make on the Creativity Club page of the Telling Tales website? Our final visit today is with a very fancy person who is going to read us a story. Everybody, it's Ladybird Fancy Pants! <laughs> Welcome! I'm so excited that you're here today! I'm here with my best friend. Whoopi, come here. Whoopi. Whoopi. Whoopi, come here. Whoopi, come here. Oh, there she is. Whoopi, come here. Whoopi, where are you? <laughs> Whoopi, come here. Come here. Come here. Oh, I got her. I got her. This is my best friend Whoopi and we're so excited to share a story with you today because it's a new story that has just come out and Whoopi's in the book. Aren't you Whoopi? Yes, you are. I've got some friends, some bird friends that might come visit too in a, in a little bit. But let's get started with the book. This book is called, There Was a Thing Inside My Shoe. And it is written by Rachel Cuthill and illustrated by my friend, Julia Veenstra. Oh, I'm so excited. Are we ready to start? Is everybody ready to start? Okay, let's, let's get started. There was a thing inside my shoe. There was a thing inside my shoe. I don't know where it's from. You see Whoopi right there? There's Whoopi. Oh, I don't like it when I get something in my shoe. You know when something gets stuck inside your shoe and it hurts to walk like a little pebble or something? I can't stand that. I can't stand it. It's purple and jagged and smells like glue. Oh, that's no fun. There it is. There it is. It's purple. Oh, I have a bird friend. Carpenter. Carpenter, we're reading a book. We're reading a book. Can you go fly away? <laughs> she blew away. It's purple and jagged and smells like glue. And sounds like a beating drum. But um, but um, but um. Oh my gosh, that's got to be really annoying. It wouldn't come out till one day I said, "There's Whoopi again." It wouldn't come out until one day I said, "Oh thing, there's a what outside." That's what she said to him. It's gobbling down some jelly and bread. And floating around on the tide. <laughs> we gotta send that thing inside, inside her shoe out of here. My thing was a curious thing, you see, and jumped right out to look. Oh, it jumped out. I was like, what's going on? What is going on out there? But the what I had described with glee was a drawing in my book. Drawing it. Oh, look, there's Whoopi again. The thing didn't know it and jumped for joy and wiggled and jiggled all day. Then up from the page jumped the decoy, also pronounced decoy, <laughs> decoy, <laughs> or decoy. And the thing and the what ran away. Oh, they ran away together. They're friends. Look at their friends. The end. Oh, I love this new book. I love it by Julia Veenstra. 
she is the artist. And by Rachel Cuthill, right here, and she is the writer. Thank you both for letting us read this book. I love this book. I think the moral of this story, what do you think the moral is, Whoopi? What do you think it is? I think it's that even though sometimes some things bother you and get in your way, you have to persist. You have to keep going and everything will work out. So I hope everything works out for everyone out there. It was so nice to see you. And I'm going to say goodbye for now. Bye, everybody. Keep reading. Ladybird Fancy Pants, look who's fancy now. And those birds, you can hear them the whole time. That was neat. Today we have really explored the world around us by looking up to the sky and looking down right to the roots of a tree. We've also learned a lot about different ways artists can express their ideas through writing, singing, sculpture, and drawing. We hope today's visit has given you ideas about all the ways you can express yourself. And so, we have a special contest for you. Write a story or create a picture inspired by what you just watched and submit it on the Telling Tales contest page for a chance to win a book from one of today's authors. Thanks again for tuning in and remember, keep looking up. Thanks for joining us and remember to visit our website for more events and to upload your artwork, your writing, your videos, and your ideas to the Telling Tales Creativity Club. Telling Tales is all about the joy of discovering how stories connect us. Tell us what you thought of this episode by filling out the survey on the Telling Tales website and you could win a book from one of today's authors. See you again.